Welcome everybody to the Patricia and Philip Frost Art Museum's signature event, Breakfast in the Park. This is our 17th year celebrating Art Basel Miami. And like the fair itself, our first digital version of Breakfast in the Park. Each year since 2004, the Patricia and Philip Frost Art Museum has welcomed guests to enjoy a complimentary breakfast which this year you had to make for yourself. I'm so sorry, but I hope you had a delicious breakfast. Look forward to next year. And I uh, hope it includes some Bacardi, um, as well as a lecture by a noted sculptor and guided tours of our sculpture park and exhibitions. We remain grateful to our presenting partner, West Kendall Baptist Hospital. I would like to acknowledge the Frost Art Museum's Advisory Council's support of our programming, as well as our growing membership please consider becoming a member of the Frost Art Museum as we depend on your generosity and support of the museum, especially during these challenging times. It is very, very easy to join through our website, frost.fiu.edu, and then just click support. As we move into 2021, which I bet we cannot wait to see, FIU continues to exercise an abundance of caution yet offer a growing student body and exciting curriculum. We are physically open to FIU Wednesdays through Saturdays and to the public on Fridays and Saturdays by appointment. We have just opened to Zorro, Pepe Mar's Love Letter to the Frost. I love that, he came up with that title, A Love Letter to the Frost. Mar's installation draws from the Frost Art Museum's permanent collection. If you are already familiar with his work, you might be able to picture our third floor galleries and what they look like. If you aren't, you must come in person to take in the experience, which by the way, comes with a new app that you can download from Apple's App Store. The Inside World, Contemporary Aboriginal Australian Memorial Poles from the Deborah and Dennis Shoal Collection will stay up through January 10th. And please, please, please do not miss House to House Women, Politics and Place up through February 7th. As I say, we're open to the public Fridays and Saturdays by appointment. I wish I could say that I'm turning the podium over now to my boss and member of the Frost Art Museum's Advisory Council, Kenneth Furton, but he was called away this morning on a family emergency. So I'm gonna say a few words on his behalf. So think of me as Kenneth Furton, here we go. FIU is fortunate to have three museums, each one different from each other in terms of content, but not mission. These museums contribute to FIU's presence as a top tier research university by transforming the lives of our students as well as enhancing the cultural life of South Florida. During COVID, we have seen our museums pivot quickly to the digital to continue their work as academic museums. It has not been an easy time for higher education. Online learning can never substitute for an in-classroom experience. Yet we've managed to put most of our courses online as well as continue the process of admitting new students and graduating cohorts of emerging professionals, which by the way, is always accompanied by a convoy of cars on campus, which is entirely, entirely appropriate for the time. The Frost continues to engage current students as well as former students, including Aurora Molina, whose work can be seen in House to House, and Pepe Mar, who has interpreted the museum's collection with his signature style and vitality. We need vitality these days. We need to stay strong, active, and energetic. West Kendall Baptist is not only a leader in the medical community, they have been a strong proponent of preventative health care. We are grateful to them for supporting this event on a continuous basis. I would like now to welcome Lourdes Bouet, CEO of West Kendall Baptist, to say a few words. Lourdes? Thank you, Jordana. It's really a pleasure to participate this year, um, keeping the spirit of Breakfast in the Park alive. West Kendall Baptist Hospital is very proud to be the major sponsor of this event. And we've been a corporate sponsor, I'm happy to say, for the past five years. We also appreciate the museum working with us as a community business partner as we collaborate to bring arts and culture to the growing communities in West Kendall and West Dade. And we look forward to continuing our relationship with the museum for years to come. 
and for West Kendall Baptist Hospital to be part of future Breakfast in the Park events in whatever form or fashion our new reality takes us to. So thank you again, um, and I hope that you enjoy this event today. Thanks, Lourdes. So now for the main event you've all been waiting for. Jeffrey Gibson, born in Colorado Springs, Colorado, but works in New York, grew up uh, in major urban centers in the US, Germany, and England. A mid-career multidisciplinary artist, he is a citizen of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians, and he's half Cherokee. He incorporates his heritage into his work, which includes abstract sculptures, paintings, and prints. Gibson earned his Master of Arts in Painting at the Royal College of Art London in 1998 and his Bachelor of Fine Arts in Painting from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 1995. He has work in the permanent collections of the Denver Art Museum, Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian, the National Gallery of Canada, Crystal Bridges, and more, as you might imagine. Gibson is a member of the faculty at Bard College, a past TED Foundation Fellow, and a Joan Mitchell Grant recipient. He is a recipient of the 2019 MacArthur Genius, as we know them, the Genius Foundation Fellowships. Jeffrey, a warm welcome to the Frost Art Museum. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Jordana. Um, I'm really glad to join you here today virtually. I'm going to start to share my screen in a second, but um, I wish I was in Miami, to be quite honest. It's freezing cold up here where I'm at. I'm about two hours north of New York City, and um, I think we were all hoping that Miami was going to be our return to some normalcy and we'd all be sitting in the sun drinking mimosas today, so maybe we can imagine that. I don't have a mimosa. I'm going to go with coffee up here. But all right, I'm going to um, start the screen. But I just want to thank the Frost Art Museum for having me. And um, thank you to Lourdes and also to Amy for um, taking part in this event. Um, OK, here we go. So OK, we're all good. Everyone can see that well. OK. So um, we're gonna move pretty quickly through. Um, I wanted to, there's a lot obviously to talk about because of the times we're in. And, um, and for me, that has meant actually working on some videos. So I'm gonna be sharing some videos towards the end of my presentation. But probably one of the pieces that I'm most known for, I suppose, is the punching bag series. Um, and it is a marker for me personally of a big shift in my practice. I'm trained as a painter, but um, I think in my painting, before I was making sculpture, I was always referring to different indigenous materials and aesthetic histories, but through the language of abstraction, through um, abstract painting. And oftentimes those narratives were not coming through to the audience. And so that was really frustrating for me. Um, and so around 2010 and 11, I decided to stop referencing things and to just start using beadwork and start using weaving and start using textiles. This piece here is from um, 2016. It's titled um, People Like Us. Um, this is part of the Everlast Punching Bag series. And what you actually see um, as far as the painted areas, these are paintings of mine from when I first moved to New York City. And um, there is a well-known story, I think at this point, of me cutting all of those paintings off of the stretcher bars, taking them to the laundromat and washing them and bringing them back to the studio where they sat for at least a good year until I realized what I could do with them. Um, the punching bags for me are a great format because I think they speak to power relationships, they speak to achievement, um, they also have a bodily um, kind of presence to them. And it all coincided when I was working with um, more traditional Indigenous artists who were making their own clothes, making their own jewelry um, and music. And I saw that for them this was a um, this was an act of resistance and an act of independence for them to do that. And there was something about transforming this punching bag, um, which for me entered my life as a kind of cathartic form of um, physical activity to address anger. So the beadwork on here, um, one of the questions I get off, often asked is the metal cones that are at the bottom there, they're called jingles. And originally jingles would have been um, the lids of tobacco and snuff containers, and that's going back into the 1700s. But um, 
but people would collect them and turn them and begin to adorn their clothing with them. And it's not until the turn of the century that it becomes an actual aesthetic um, and it becomes a gendered dance among women. And, um, and so the jingle dress dance is to some people now considered um, ceremonial and it is a healing dance, the sound of the jingles as they move. But the way that I use jingles, um, you would never really see that kind of abundance of them on a dress. And also um, I use them because I'm really, I try to find ways to highlight the kind of ingenuity and innovation and creativity of native people throughout this time that we're usually taught about as being wholly traumatic. And although I don't wanna dismiss those histories at all, I'm always impressed that people continued making and that people continued finding ways to incorporate new materials and new forms. Um, after the punching bags, I was really um, drawn to the figurative presence of them, um, heavily influenced by Louise Bourgeois' figures, which is something that I have always paid attention to. And it takes me years until I kind of figure out how to bring my language into something like that. This is um, in a series of, they're, they're actually not that small. The figure itself is probably about four to four and a half feet tall, um, using all materials that you would find um, through powwow vendors. There's rawhide, glass beads, uh, jingles and copper brass and tin, and then nylon fringe. And you can see the text really came in around 2013. Um, like I said, I come from a process-based abstract painting background and I've always used words to really describe my work um, pretty subjectively. And I think when it came to creating these garments and the beadwork and I realized I could put words into the beadwork, it just became obvious to me that that would become a part of the design. This is a piece um, from 2015. Um, it's titled, Can't Take My Eyes Off of You. I believe um, uh, you would see the text kind of draped around the shoulders if we were able to see the back here. And this is also the beginning of me using ceramic. The heads of these pieces are ceramic. And then the armature underneath is um, uh, recycled teepee poles that have been lashed together with rawhide. Um, this is a wall hanging. <clears throat> um, and the text reads, American history is longer, larger, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it, JB. And those initials um, refer to James Baldwin. And James Baldwin, Nina Simone, these are two people who I've returned to numerous times. Um, I continue to look at today, everything from writings to interviews to their writing and their music. Um, and also just paying attention to um, the choices they made as creative people in their life. I think early on, I realized that being Native American, being gay, I was a little unsure how to navigate the art world in particular. And their example of living abroad mirrored to some degree my experience of growing up abroad and understanding the difference of how I was received as a person in um, Korea, in London, in Norway, compared to the US. And so a lot of their statements about that have, have really resonated with me. Um, this is a piece from 2016, titled In Numbers Too Big to Ignore. And um, those words are um, appropriated from Helen Reddy's song, I Am Woman, Hear Me Roar. Um, I oftentimes look at different movements, whether it's civil rights movements, feminist movements, LGBTQ plus movements. Um, for strategies and words and think about how they can apply to indigenous histories. And um, this actually, you know, I'm an educator, so I've been facilitating and working with students um, during Black Lives Matter movements, and especially during the Black Lives Walkout um, a few years ago. And when I was traveling, I went to Winnipeg, and it's really where I met so many people who were impacted by the missing and murdered indigenous women's movement. And so when I returned, this was the piece that kind of came out from those conversations. And I wanted it to look like we were looking from an aerial view of like a, a protest where there was everyone kind of coming together into this central form. Um, <clears throat> this piece here, like I said, I am trained as a painter and um, I, shifted painting from canvas onto painting on hide after doing a lot of research about the histories of painting on hide within indigenous histories. Um, the kind of painting I do is oftentimes called tonal painting. I'll work with one color. I will layer it up in transparent color. And it works really well with rawhide because you can see these are 
basically two exactly two exactly the same paintings. Um, I don't think I said that correctly, but two paintings painted in the same exact way. And um, the difference is, is that you see the one on the right, <clears throat> this kind of bruise or discoloration in the hide. If you look up close, you'll see things like scars, scratches, you'll see uh, pores, you'll see hair follicles, and things that remind you that you're looking at two animals before there's been paint put on top. So they can never exactly be the same painting. And this is um, the styptic format is something that I've continued to play with. Um, and for me, conceptually, it's really about the kind of individuality of things, no matter how much they might look alike. Um, inherently, they're always going to be unique to the, unto themselves. This is a full deer hide, um, this painting. And again, geometric abstraction is something that for me, um, I, I have always loved in both Western and European abstract histories. But um, when I look at Native American histories, you know, the geometric abstraction that happens in embroidery, that happens in painting, that happens in quill work, bead work, I was always shocked that they were never put into an exhibition to be in conversation with each other. Um, one almost claims total formalism and without content, and the other one um, claims total identity, content around who you are, um, where you come from, um, and oftentimes the idea of storytelling within that language, but also a calling to ancestors for protection. So for me, I just became really interested in this interplay between those two uh, histories and started finding ways to put it together. So here I just filled this completely organic shape of a, of a deer hide, um, filling it with geometry that kind of fills out the space bit by bit. <clears throat> this is another full hide piece. Um, and around the outside of it, so the interior, you have a painted hide with a pattern on it with the text. And then we have brass, copper, iron, steel, um, actually upholstery tacks that radiate out from, radiate out from the, the periphery of the hide. Um, and then the text is from um, Kate Bush's woman's work. And it reads, I know you have a lot of strength left. And then I started to play with color with text to bring out a secondary text that says, I have strength left. So, you know, with the punching bags, most of my materials did come from um, what, you know, would have really been used for regalia for dancers in the powwow circuit. And um, the idea that the fringe is meant to move, the ribbons are meant to swing in the air, the jingles are meant to make sound, eventually led to the idea of creating garments. And um, this is a garment for myself um, that I wore in a performance in 2016. It was commissioned for Site Santa Fe, um, the biennial in 2016. And the performance itself is a really an endurance-based performance because the garment weighs about 125 pounds. And so um, in the performance, I do the movements of these different animals, which you see identified in the drawings in the back. But um, after a while, you see I'm literally trembling because it's difficult to lift my arms, it's difficult to sit down, it's difficult to drum. Everything becomes increasingly difficult um, to get through the performance. So this is generally how it's installed with the garment um, hung on teepee poles over a drum with the drawings and the video documenting the performance. The punching bags have continued. Um, this is a piece from 2018. Um, they have continued in many ways. Um, oftentimes love, relationships are things that I return to. I'm definitely of the generation of the personal is political. Um, I think, you know, for me, the kind of division between my personal life and my private life, my, uh, my professional life, um, like most artists is blurred at many times. This is probably around the time when uh, my children entered into my life. Um, and this, the words on here say love is the drug and up close the entire surface is covered with um, charms of hearts, which I think hearts are, um, I think they're a challenging shape to like, to be honest. I think they're kind of, they range everywhere from like the corny to the totally um, kind of um, symbolic. Uh, there's some on here from the 1940s, there's gold ones, there's silver ones, and then there's just of course metal trinket ones all over the place. Um, this is a wall hanging altar from 2018. And the text on here says, "'Tis grace that has brought me thus far and grace will lead me home, um, which is from the hymn Amazing Grace. And then in the center, it says back to life, back to reality, which is from soul to soul. 
And um, the beginning of this wall hanging is actually a trading post weaving, which is what you see in the center um, that's been beaded onto. And um, so the trading post weavings are really something that I wanted to use because I think everybody was approaching, who was coming into my studio, were approaching textiles and, and weavings as if they were all kind of culturally heavy with a ceremonial kind of purpose. And I think trading post weavings for me are interesting because they were really weavers, really world-class weavers who were using their skill to support their families. So these weavings were meant to be bought. They were meant to be used. They were commissioned by the trading posts and um, oftentimes in overproduction. So you can still find some today that have never seen the light of day. <clears throat> I collect many things and um, trading post weavings are one of them. And so, and also it's interesting, um, both of my grandfathers were Southern Baptist ministers. So my interest in, um, in hymns and in the Bible even really stem from that, just trying to find ways, because every, I think everyone thinks that those two things are very counter, you know, traditional native belief systems and Christianity. But in my upbringing, there's been a lot of crossover and, um, and, and, and also separation. And so um, it's just something that I return to um, in terms of looking for words. Um, this was from my show in, uh, with my gallery in New York City, Sikkima Jenkins. Um, this was also in 2018. Um, the title of the show was I Am a Rainbow Too. And it was something that I really wanted to explore, the rainbow, the LGBTQ plus rainbow. Um, mainly because when I was in the, when I was coming out like in the late, in the early 90s, um, I really rejected this kind of vision of the rainbow. Um, I, it wasn't anything that I really wanted to be a part of. And then looking back now, you know, 20 plus years later, I just really wanted to pay respect to the rainbow and how much it's cohered so many um, civil movements. And, um, and, and so in this, it's kind of, I wanted to take something that could otherwise be kind of, um, cliche and, and possibly kitschy and I wanted to explore it and, and broaden it and deepen it. Excuse me, I'm gonna cough. <clears throat> this is what happens when your heaters come on. And over there, um, the last night a DJ saved my life. This is also a um, punching bag from 2018. So this is one piece. This is that same painting and, um, and this is on canvas. The, the canvases are all the same size. Um, and then they all take on um, a color of the Roy G. Biv rainbow, and then there's a beaded frame that goes around each one. Um, this was also the year that I returned, 2018 was the year that I returned to painting on large scale canvases. Um, right now I still continue to paint on both hide and canvas. The canvas allows me to go really large and the hide tends to be a much more intimate scale. Um, these, uh, I created a series of letter forms that you know, represent the entire 26 letter alphabet. And um, the frames have beadwork inset into custom frames. Most of the words come from lyrics of songs. Um, sometimes younger people don't recognize the music that I'm pulling from and oftentimes people my age do. This is from a Janet Jackson song. Um, there are times when I feel you smile upon me. This is a painting titled Trouble Don't Last Always. Um, again, back into geometric abstraction, playing with ideas of color spectrums. Um, Trouble Don't Last Always are words taken from a sermon. Um, and of course about, you know, that everything moves on, that trouble doesn't sit with us forever. Um, and so those sorts of words are things that oftentimes I just think about like how to name the abstraction that I'm working with. Uh, I work with a kind of painting where I'm glazing. So again, that transparent color, and that's how I achieve color shifts from, you know, I can really go from any color to any color, and we can find a kind of gradient in between just by layering up these transparent layers. <clears throat> so the garments have continued as well. In 2018, I had a show with the Welland Museum working with um, Tracy Adler. And she asked me, you know, was there a new body of work that I would like to debut in the exhibition? And we thought about these garments. And the idea was to create almost like kind of uh, garments for transformation for this community of people who were totally diverse, totally inclusive, centering on um, LGBTQ plus people of color. And so the garments are quite large. Some of these are about 10 to 11 feet tall. 
Um, and we did photograph people wearing them to give a sense of what they look like on a person. Um, these helmets were originally made to go with each garment and then <clears throat> I separated them. So they became their own sculptures in their own right. Um, left to right, we have the love helmet, we have the death helmet, we have, the, I'm sorry, peace helmet, death helmet, love helmet, Oceana, and the clown helmet on the right. So here we have um, somebody who lives here locally in Hudson. Um, <clears throat> sorry, this is Shanika McIntosh who lives here. And um, she's wearing uh, one of the garments and you can see the jingles are printed on the side, so they're quite large. And then there are actual jingles on the front. <clears throat> she's standing on a block, which is about three feet tall. So it enables her to be able to actually have the garment to hang. And um, they were kind of amazing to make because they kind of turn somebody into a sculpture. You can't move very freely in them. You really have to be very conscious and kind of intentional in your movements. This is Henry Williams wearing the clown helmet. And the helmets, I wanted kind of like the head to almost become part of the same information of the helmet, right? And so um, he's wearing one of the garments as well. And then the helmets weigh, they're incredibly heavy. They weigh about 35 to 40 pounds each. So for these photographs, we literally have like handlers on the side ready to catch it should it start to fall. But we have to get the person to just sort of like hold themselves very upright um, and kind of strengthen their neck. And then we place it on long enough for the photograph. This is the love helmet. And that is a massive amethyst crystal on top of her head. And she gets to peer through. This is also a local person, um, Anana, who lives here in Hudson as well also wearing one of the garments from the exhibition. So these photographs were really taken for the, um, for the catalog, but I've continued photographing people in them. This is an installation view from the new museum where we continued this body of work into garments. And then the helmet shifted into these much lighter um, river cane reed basketry helmets in the back here on the right. And so this is where I think all the work starts to kind of feed into itself. Um, every time someone's photographed in the garments, they sign a model release knowing that that image can find its way into anything. It can find its way into a painting. It can find its way printed um, onto a fabric. And so you can see here, this is a group of young women who received art scholarships to come to New York and they wanted to meet me. So I asked them if they wanted to come to the studio and be photographed in garments. And that those images eventually found their way into textiles that found their way into these garments. Um, part of the new museum exhibition, which was titled The Anthropophagic Effect, um, was to have people come in, uh, I invited people to come in to wear the helmets, to wear the garments, to be photographed on site. Um, this is Roxy Romero, who um, I've continued working with in other ways. And um, I had no idea she was going to have fluorescent yellow nail paint on, but she did. And so we photographed her. We had a fluorescent yellow room in the exhibition. And um, I think the photographs are, I don't know, I love, I love the photographs. I love seeing people in the helmets and in the garments. <clears throat> this is MX Oops, performance artist and Xavier Ryan, who's a musician. This was shot in my studio with them both wearing a garment and then they're in front of two of the paintings that were in the Sikkim Jenkins show. So when we do a photo shoot, it's literally like everything is up for grabs in the studio. Um, I did used to work as a stylist just out of graduate school in London. And so I kind of get to go back to those days and work with a photographer, but it's for my own work. So this was the, um, the poster image for um, the show at the New Museum. So um, I'm just gonna go back to this shot for a second. Um, when we were at the New Museum, part of it was um, Johanna Burton, who was the curator. She asked me if I wanted to do a performance. <clears throat> and so I said, yes, and MX is part of a voguing world in Manhattan. And so I asked, I asked them to reach out to some friends and would they consider voguing in my garments? And so, um, and then I'm also a huge fan of Laura Ortman, who is a White Mountain Apache violinist. And so the video that I'm gonna show you, is a very short excerpt of that 30 minute performance, but it's one person playing and um, there were, uh, how many dancers were there? There were four dancers. So we'll just watch that. <laughs> And so 
So um, we're just going to go to the next slide. So that was really exciting for me because it was kind of an experiment. And especially in terms of what it means for me to collaborate with somebody, I realized that I see my contribution as the garments, as the idea. But when it comes to kind of anything more than that, I really step back. I mean, I invite people to collaborate who I have so much respect for what they do. I really just want them to come in and use what I'm contributing to create something new. And that's been a kind of continued practice for me. Um, you'll see more of it in a couple of, a couple of images later. Um, this was a, sh a painting from 2019. Um, this was at Kavi Gupta Gallery in Chicago. Um, this is also acrylic on canvas. She knows other worlds and then um, a beaded frame. And in total, I think this is about 81 inches tall. So these are on the larger side for what, for what I do. This one is currently, um, this is the title piece for the exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, when fire is applied to a stone, it cracks. And that exhibition um, was really uh, an opportunity for me to go into the collections at the Brooklyn Museum, pull a number of pieces out and then exhibit them side by side in, in, in conversation with work that comes out of my studio. This was also from 2019, Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. Um, also acrylic on canvas with a custom beaded frame. And like I said, so when you get photographed here, that image could find its, itself anywhere. Um, in this quilt, um, speak to me in ways so that I can understand is the title of that sculpture in the kind of pink area on the left. I see more sculptures from early 20, what is that, would it be 2012, 2013. Um, there's vintage quilt pieces in here. There's fabric from different performance garments that we've made. And uh, in fact, actually a drawing of my daughter's probably from when she was about two. And, um, you know, all of these fabrics are sitting in this closet here. So I, I do have a love of quilts. I think about kind of collage patchwork quilts um, when I'm making paintings. And um, so I just decided to finally start making some. And I work with a quilter who lives here in Troy, New York, named Robert Berman. And, um, and so this is one of the quilts that we've completed. Um, and some of that, so he teaches love, this uh, border fabric here, you'll see in the beginning of this performance, um, next performance. And this was, um, this was commissioned by the National Portrait Gallery in 2019. They play endlessly. They fight for the land. Their children stand tall. Thank you. 
They make her story. She knows other worlds. So um, I just want to give some background. So this performance was commissioned by the National Portrait Gallery, but has been performed two other times, once um, at the New Museum and once at uh, Esker Foundation in Calgary. And each time um, we solicit volunteers, about 50 people to come in, and we meet them for about one day um, to help train them to move through the movements for timing. The whole performance is about an hour. And, um, and so we, when we do the open call, it really is, um, we, we ask pe for people who identify as uh, LGBTQ plus and also a person of color. Um, and so it's the first time I meet them is usually the day of in the morning and then we perform around 3 p.m. Um, so moving on, this is the opening. Um, when you first walk into the galleries at the Brooklyn Museum, this piece, um, like I said, they let me borrow from their collection or incorporate pieces from their collection. This is a Charles Rumsey sculpture from, I believe, 1904, um, titled The Dying Indian. Um, it's one of many of its kind that was sort of about the demise of Native people and the idea that we wouldn't exist in the future. So it's a kind of image that I've always wanted to work with. Um, on the wall is a frieze that is a model of a frieze that is currently, I believe, on the Brooklyn Bridge. And the lyrics on the, the text on the wall says, I'm gonna run with every minute I can borrow, which are from um, Roberta Flack. Um, and then at the base of the sculpture are all uh, moccasins taken, borrowed from, the, not taken, borrowed from the collection of the Brooklyn Museum. This is an installation view of the larger gallery, um, which is my work and also pieces from the collection. Um, so just before quarantine, we had this amazing opportunity from uh, Times Square Arts had asked me to uh, activate all, let's see, I think it's about 70 video monitors in Times Square. And so we created a video and we used the music of um, a song called Sisters by a tribe called Red. And this is their little clip of um, Sarah, Sarah Ortegon, who is somebody I've worked with previously, um, who came and danced live at the debut. That was March 7th. Uh, it was the day of the art fairs, the Saturday of the art fairs being in New York. And everybody was talking about coronavirus and um, kind of joking that, you know, we weren't sure what was going to happen next. But this was the last live art thing that I was able to, to be a part of. Um, so this is some very recent work. In fact, uh, this was work which was completed during quarantine. Um, we were very fortunate that we were all able to keep the full um, staff here working in the studio. People were able to take things home. And over time, uh, my studio was an old turn of the century schoolhouse with, uh, let's see, what do we have? Like maybe 11 school rooms. So it makes it possible for people to work independently in a classroom by themselves. So eventually people started coming back in. This piece is probably about eight feet tall. Um, it's fringe. Uh, copper covered jingles and glass beads. And this is just for scale comparison.
And this piece is titled Sentinel. So this was part of a body of work for a show that was meant to open in May in um, Los Angeles, and then we'll be opening in now January. So we just, um, just started sharing images recently. This is another piece from that show um, titled She Was a Beautiful Boy. Uh, these lyrics are from the song Born Slippy by Underworld. And this is a beaded panel that's about 40 inches tall by 30 inches wide. This is not a part of the show, but this is a diptych drum. The diptychs have continued as a way to kind of play with um, comparisons between two objects which are inherently unique, but on first glance can appear to be the same. Um, this is from the Roberts Project show. This is a combination of acrylic on canvas and then beaded panels and set into a frame. Bring down the walls, let them fall, fall, fall which is from a 1993 song, which at the time was just about social walls and social barriers. And so I think now, of course, the wall means something completely different. But um, um, a song, One Foot in Glory, One Foot in Hell by Terry Callier um, formed the lyrics. And a lot of times people ask like, how do I come across words? And, and honestly, there are times when I'll block out like two hours just to sit and listen to you know one or two songs and I'll just listen to them over and over and over again on repeat and um, I write things down I play with the words I mix them up I change them and um, and eventually things kind of will remain on one long list and then the kind of selections edited selections from that list come off and find their way into work so currently, right, um, currently at Socrates Sculpture Park in Long Island City, this is a structure that I was asked to, um, to think about making a large structure that referred to a monument. Um, I decided to build a ziggurat structure that refers to the Mississippian mound culture, who made structures similar to this, much larger. This is a 44 foot square footprint. Um, in reality, they can go up to almost 300 square feet square. Um, and you would find them in Illinois, but this is the one based off of Cahokia. And I put text on the four sides of it. So the four texts recede, um, read, respect indigenous land. The other one reads, the future is present. One reads powerful because we're different. And one reads in numbers too big to ignore. Um, part of the exhibition was to activate the, um, the structure. And so I invited Laura Ortman, again, who I worked with in, at the New Museum, Emily Johnson, who's a dancer and choreographer, and Raven Chacon. And so here's just a, a clip from the video of Laura's performance. So um, it's been pretty wild uh, during quarantine to try to figure out how to continue making work. And with Socrates, the structure was already about two thirds built by the time we started quarantining. And then we realized that Laura lives in, um, in New York City, so she didn't have to travel. Um, we didn't have an audience. We had everybody you know, so, um, you know, safely spaced apart and we didn't have an audience. So, um, yeah, we've, you know, I've been very fortunate that people have tried to find ways to continue. Um, this was actually meant to be a sculptural piece, what you're looking at here. This is a um, still from a video that I worked on commissioned by the Wattis Institute, which opened in October. Um, it's still playing on their site, but originally it was meant to be on a jumbotron inside of their space. So you would have been able to go in and it's, it would have been massive with this surround sound. I'm just going to play a few clips for you. And this is, I suppose this is, this is kind of new for me, but it, you know, with all of the kind of anxiety around the last, you know, seven, eight, nine months, 
um, and leading up to the election, I was really just trying to force together a series of images of the things that I was paying attention to and, and how it was making me feel. So um, this piece is titled, Nothing is Eternal. <laughs> I should also say this piece is playing, being projected um, as part of the Basque Museum New World Symphony um, program currently um, from 8 to 10 p.m. at night. Uh, here's another clip. So the videos um, have been a big part of these past few months. And the one I'm going to show you now, um, unfortunately, I wish I could show you the whole thing, but I'm going to move through it bit by bit. Um, this is the one that we just wrapped up. It would debut with the Palm Springs Art Museum on Friday, Friday evening. Um, and so this piece is titled um, To Feel Myself Beloved on the Earth. And I'll just let you watch and I'll move through it. There's, there's a lot of it to go in there, but I worked with um, six different performers who I have worked with previously, and then drummers, seven different drummers who we actually found on Instagram. Uh, and luckily they were available due to COVID. They're not touring, so they were all very excited to um, take part in a gig. And um, so anyhow, so it, it was really wonderful. I um, mean, it was about creatives trying to like center ourselves and find reasons to continue making work. A lot of it had to do with indulging in our practices, but also connecting with nature. 
And so um, that's what the video kind of explores over 15 minutes. But I'll stop there and um, we can move on to, to questions. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. What an incredible way to start this week and to spend this morning. Uh, I really appreciated your thought-provoking, uh, engaging, and rigorous lecture. Uh, it's such an honor for us to have you participate in, in a program with us. Uh, some questions are starting to come in on the chat, but I wanted to ask one of my own. Um, music, I think, for me and your work, there's such an element of joy, seduction, desire, nostalgia. Um, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more. I know you referenced it and you talked about like, listening to songs, but maybe even if you would be willing to talk from a personal point of view about the role of music um, in, in your life and development of an artist and how it's become such a key component of the work. Yeah, I think it's truly, it's just such a love for music. And it's always been such a huge part of my life, even if I wasn't an artist, you know, I think um, I grew up with my parents listening to Motown. Like I remember listening to Motown in the house, like every weekend, it was a special thing that the radio was on. And it was always, um, you know, Marvin Gaye. And it was always just, and then my dad was really into Prince. And so there was always that. And, and then I uh, latched on to music, I think probably from moving around you know, um, my dad was in the service, so living in Germany and Korea, American music was this thing that we all looked forward to. There was one radio station, American radio station, and they would play like new music um, every night at midnight. And we would talk about it the next day, like what that song was. So I don't know if that had an influence, but when I returned to the US, started going to clubs, started getting into DJ culture, dance culture. It just was the, the community that I found that supported me everywhere I went. So it was always gay clubs, um, Chicago house music, hip hop, moved to London, it was jungle. It was, you know, all sorts of pop music. And, and uh, yeah, even now I still look for new music um, all the time. And we have a lot of young people who work in the studio. And if I realize that somebody is really good with music. I'll ask them to start putting together playlists for me. And um, yeah, it's just, I, I love it. And it's like, I feel like everyone should have a soundtrack, right? To your life. <laughs> like, absolutely, absolutely. And I love the way that the soundtrack, uh, soundtracks of our lives change um, yeah. over time. Yeah. Uh, we have a nice question from my colleague, Liz Shannon, who is actually now at the Wellen uh, Museum. Oh. Uh, and she's wondering if you have any dream projects, any projects that have been kind of toiling around for a while um, that you might be willing to share. You know, um, it's interesting. Every time I work with video, it's I, I, I always think that it seems so easy and then it's so much work. Video is so much work and there's so many people involved, but I get so excited by it. And working with dancers and choreographers and the editing process, and now with sound engineers where we're creating our own sounds, um, I could imagine doing like a long, a longer video, like something much more, a narrative is something that to me, I've always kind of resisted the idea of like a fully fleshed out linear narrative. But I think now I understand why, what I can do with video that I can't do with other things, which is that I can show one experience or one object from multiple perspectives. And that's really how I view the world as I, I get caught up in, in how one thing means so many different things to different people. And I think I could explore that in film. That's great. Um, another great question coming in from my colleague, Mariana Ramirez, who's the director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum at Portland State University. And she's wondering if you could talk a little bit more, you mentioned in your talk about working with students around Black Lives Matter. Um, and if you could talk a little bit about that, that collaboration. Yeah, I mean, we're still doing it now. Um, it, as far as at Bard, we're still having those conversations and they've almost gotten tougher. They've gotten more complicated, I think. Um, I love artists. The artists who I'm friends with, who I pay attention to, tend to be queer artists of color, um, artists of color in general. I think it's one of the most exciting things I've seen happen since, uh, for me, since the early 2000s, to see that kind of explode um, and to, to witness the kind of pushback of it, you know, and the kind of resentment of it. And um, yeah, so I think I, that's what I can bring to the table. You know, I can bring to the students, I can say, 
this is, this is someone who has like carved out and forged their own path. And I can tell you why their voice is so important and why I can, I can show you that it didn't exist before they began making this work, you know, which I think is a really powerful thing to show a student. Um, but I have been really surprised during all these conversations to learn about how Black Lives Matter um, impacts other fields, you know, like the sciences and literature and dance and math, you know, um, it's been a real eye opener because I generally pay attention to the arts. Oh, I, I think it is really interesting and important, uh, especially for us at an academic museum to think about these things interdisciplinary and how other fields and professions um, are affected by social justice movements that are so uh, vital. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a really wonderful question, so I, I want to read it carefully here. Um, and it's coming in from Mahel or Michelle Peters. Uh, your pieces, your beautiful pieces feel very much uh, outward facing, layering up broad identities that are a part of your life. Do you feel that your process pulls you inward to the specifics of your Native American expressions and beliefs of the Cherokee and Choctaw? No. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll tell you, that's a much bigger answer than just a simple no. Um, you know, part of my, like, so here's maybe an example. I, for the Roberts Project show, which, like I said, which is going to happen in January, it's the very first time I've ever titled anything in Choctaw words. And the words are um, very simple words. They're like, for, for instance, one of the figures is titled Purple Stone. And it's because it's covered in amethyst. And now what does amethyst have to do with Choctaw? Probably not very much of anything. Um, purple stone is not something which is calling to be seen as, as um, spiritual nor ceremonial. It is literally a formal description of the piece, right? And um, I realized that in my career, let's say over the last 15 years, I have pulled very um, generously from an intertribal aesthetic. And with the idea that I'm talking to an audience which is primarily non-native. And so people who, when we hear the word Native American, you don't think about the 500 plus recognized tribes and what those differences are. But I knew that one day I wanted to become more specific, both in what I was talking about, but also, um, you know, a title is a space of an artwork that you can occupy. And, and so to put those words there, and one of the rules with those words is that they are never meant to be translated like in parentheses afterwards. You can translate them in a, in a larger text below it, but it's not meant to say um, the Choctaw words and then the translation. And so it's small things like that where I think now, and the Mississippian culture, the ziggurat structure is the, one of the first times I've begun to reference specifically Southeastern kind of tribes. But um, yeah, I think it's important that I am very honest in the fact that I, I where I grew up, you know, I grew up internationally and I grew up, um, it, would, it would be false of me to present otherwise. Thank you. And you're, I want to mention you're getting a lot of love in the chat and we're getting some good comments about whether or not people will be able to watch this again. Uh, a few professors have said they want to share it with other students. Um, yes, we recorded this lecture today, so you will be able to find it on our website. Uh, Jeffrey, one of our staff members was um, asking about the connection, sort of thinking about the pandemic and COVID um, and your use of uh, video, um, but then also the interest in the tactile and the handmade. Um, you know, have the last seven months at all made you sort of think differently um, about media um, and materials and the work you're doing in your studio? Um, it's made me really appreciate my studio. You know, I really have an incredibly committed group of people who work here. And I think in the last, you know, five years, they've become increasingly committed to the messages that we send out through the work. Um, they're all young people who identify across a gender spectrum, who identify across a, a sexual preference spectrum, a race spectrum. And I think um, we have created a space here where we really, that's not who they are when they walk in the door. You know what I mean? They are, they are hands to me, they are brains to me. We talk, we support each other um, and there's talent here. So I think, you know, I know that we're not reflective of what the larger world looks like 
we are this idealistic bubble that we have created and that we nurture and support here. But it's made me truly appreciate the world that we've crafted here. Now, in terms of like um, audio and video stuff, um, I realized for me, <clears throat> in fact, actually the editing decisions came a lot from creating a textile where we were working with quilts and we we're working with sheer fabrics. So that's what kind of became part of the aesthetic and editing video was just like, let's layer and mash them up and kind of have them fuse into each other and become this kind of total, total stream, right? This total stream of consciousness. And that's really, you know, that is a big challenge. I, I have started trying to think about new mediums as like, what is the craft of video? What is the craft of sound? What is the craft of editing? You know, <clears throat> because I can talk to you about the craft of beadwork or the craft of sewing, but um, <clears throat> I've started to think about that word craft as more sort of like artisanal skill. Like, that, and oftentimes that's impractical, right? It's not about the easiest option or the fastest option. It's sort of like, you experiment across the spectrum of what you can do with a material or a medium, and then you experiment until you find the combination that supports the content you're trying to get across. Uh, you mentioned beadwork, and actually a question just popped up in the chat um, about beads. And the, the Martha Wilkes is asking if you could elaborate a little bit more um, about the use of beads and even the process uh, that unfolds in your studio. Well, I used to do all the beadwork um, and, and we used to, I used to produce maybe two or three things a year. And I knew that um, as an artist, I wanted to have a big impact. I wanted to take part in exhibitions. I wanted to produce more than that annually. And so I started bringing in assistants and um, some of those people already knew different kinds of beadwork. Uh, most of the beadwork that I knew, I was taught by a woman named Mavis Nakanish in Chicago in the 90s. Um, I also worked in collections for four years, so I was able to see a lot. I collect a lot of beadwork. I look at how things were done and I try to replicate it. Um, but now the beadwork is done by uh, mostly through studio assistants. It's all done here in the studio. Um, we do drawings of everything. It starts with a digital sketch, which then goes into a hand drawn. It's literally um, a photocopied bead template that we tape together into whatever size we need and then we color it in that gets cut apart and then it gets divvied up to people and um, they can take it home, which during COVID was very helpful. And then they get reassembled. Um, so yeah, that's, the, that's how the beadwork works. Um, there's about 19 colors I can play with and every now and again, we'll go into different size beads, but I also collect beads. So, um, so there's some other pieces, which I don't think we really saw today where I'll get to use unique beads and I buy vintage beads that you can't find anymore and clay beads and catlinite beads. And yeah, I have a whole collection. Nice, very nice. Well, um, Jeffrey, I am not only an avid follower of your artwork, but also your Instagram account. Uh, <laughs> and recently uh, you recommended some books, uh, one of which is Indigenous Futurism, which is a, a book that accompanies an exhibition uh, we were really proud uh, earlier this fall, we co-hosted a performance with Elisa Harkins, um, oh, cool. who incorporates um, this notion of indigenous futurism. I wonder if you could elaborate at all on the role of the notion of the speculative or future um, in your own work, in your own practice. Um, you mean as far as future, indigenous futurism generally or specifically in my work? <clears throat> I was thinking specifically in your work, but either take it either way, whichever you prefer. Well, it's interesting because I think, you know, the, the, the foundation necessary to imagine a future, I found and still find very lacking for Native people. And a lot of that has to do with us being able to place ourselves wholly in the present, right? We have to be able to see ourselves reflected in this world that we're living in. And there's a huge lack in that where we don't see ourselves reflected. The Native art world exists in these very small pockets across the globe. And so for us to be able to come together and see each other's work and communicate and articulate differences and similarities, is, it's a challenge. And those histories are also in these little niche pockets. They, they are not collected. So if you wanted to study Native American art history, you're literally going to be pulled in a million different directions because it hasn't been, it hasn't been put together in any sort of scholarly kind of thread mm -hmm. in the way that many other histories have. So I think as a project or, you know, however we want to think about it, I think that that's the first step is to try to create a, a kind of 
a network that can be navigated by somebody to learn. And then from there, I think the future is about um, kind of realizing that those histories are about content and not necessarily about the materials and that the materials can change. I think it can become digital. I think it can become academic. It can exist in many, many languages. Um, the spirituality can exist in many different ways as well. But I feel like, and, and that's what I think the next chapters of my work, I hope will be about, because I do feel like I have, I have built a foundation for myself of understanding <clears throat> where I don't feel that lack any longer. Like I have built a world for myself where I get to come in and call the shots and make what I wanna make and do the experiments that I wanna do. Um, and I have been very fortunate with support and so in that sense, my hope is to let myself kind of give myself the freedom to kind of just move forward and not feel kind of tethered. I mean, obviously, I, you know, I always tell people there's lots of things I would never do. There's lots of things I would never show. There's lots of places I would never go into because I think that, um, you know, in terms of like cultural respect, and maybe this goes back to that earlier question about deepening within Cherokee and Choctaw, you know, it, it is sort of like where, I am entitled to deepen. Those are the places where I'm entitled to deepen. And, and so maybe that this is the beginning of that, you know. But um, yeah, but for right now, and it's a it's it is a hard shift. It's a really hard shift. But one of the things I've started doing is saying no to um, things that I feel like I've done for the last 15 years. You know, I'm like, I don't need to do those things anymore. I can look for different opportunities and and I can even instigate new conversations. Well, I think that's, you know, really an important thought because, you know, you had so much incredible um, opportunity, I feel like, with um, the show uh, Jeffrey Gibson, Like a Hammer. And if any of you are interested in learning more about Jeffrey's work, um, that catalog is a great start, as is Jeffrey Gibson, This is the Day, um, that was produced uh, by uh, the Wellen Museum. They're, they're both really incredible catalogs. But I was thinking about that a little bit in preparation for, for today. How do you approach you know, each new solo project? Um, and you know, how, um, yeah, I guess, I guess that's my question because it feels like they're always so intentional, you know, whether they're at Kavi Gupta, whether they're um, at the Brooklyn Museum um, and, and that they have, that they all stand on, on their own. Well, thank you, first of all. Um, <clears throat> but also, I really, um, they're getting harder to do because I think um, each opportunity is, I never want to start just sort of like repeating things. Like the, the Socrates Sculpture Park piece is going to travel to the De Cordova in Massachusetts. And so right now we're working on the programming for there and what the surface of it will be like. And I'm bringing in a lot of collaborators. And one of the most exciting parts in Long Island City was really for me to be able to step out and offer that structure to someone else to activate and to really give them freedom and to um, be there in support of them. And so with De Cordova, we're doing that on an even larger scale. You know, So we're finding ways for people to program it through digital media, through print media, through performance, through sound and taking everything we learned in Long Island City. Um, for other projects that are coming up, you know, part of the studio, part of the reason why we have this many people working here is so that I can experiment, you know? So my job as an artist right now is to kind of find the most interesting seeds of projects. And um, sometimes that's in sound, sometimes it's in video, sometimes it's an in installation, in sculpture. And I might task someone here in the studio to just make a sample and that sample slowly grows over two years, you know. But I've also had to talk to people very directly, galleries that I work with and curators who I work with. I've had to talk with them really directly that we need to find a way to move on from the things that I've already done, you know. Um, and I understand there may come a day when it makes sense to revisit some older ideas, but I really think it's important. Um, well, I'll tell you one, one thing that's coming up is I'm working with Denise Marconish at Mass MoCA to do that massive space, 18,000 square feet. And so <clears throat> when she asked me initially, you know, I was making 
hand beaded pieces. And we both agreed, we're not gonna fill 18,000 square feet with hand beaded works, nor is it the point. So the challenge is how do we address the space and how do we fill it with atmosphere? You know, what is that? And that's really what led me to video, to sound, to performance, to the garments, like they're really thinking about what objects really occupy space and light, light became one of those things, which of course leads to projection and, and other things. And so, <clears throat> so I think, and collaboration. And so, um, you know, that will have been a four year process by the time it happens. We're kind of halfway there right now. And, um, and I started a few things and they've kind of taken little bits and pieces and, you know, you, we just, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. But luckily also right now, you know, there's a huge archive of work, which certain exhibitions can, can happen on loans, you know? So I'm not always having to be so involved in, in all of it. That's really great. Um, Jeffrey, I wanna thank you again. It's such a privilege and pleasure to have you join us this morning for our Breakfast in the Park um, talk. And I do hope that you'll make your way to Miami next year um, and that- <laughs> Um, I also want to thank all of you for tuning in today. I want to especially thank our members. Uh, if you're not a member, I hope you will consider joining us uh, at the Frost Art Museum. Check out frost.fiu.edu for more information on upcoming events. On behalf of my director, Jordana Pomeroy, uh, and myself, we wish you a very happy day. Take care. Great. Thank you all so much.